So today's video is day number two of True Crime Week. If you are new around here, every single day this week from Monday to Sunday, I am uploading a different true crime case. Every single case that I'm covering this week has been a really, really highly requested case on my channel and today's is no exception. Today we're gonna to be talking about a really heavy case. This is the case of Victoria Climbier and I do just want to give a warning in the beginning of this. If you are particularly sensitive to child deaths or abusive storylines, then this is probably not the video for you. Feel free to go and watch yesterday's video. It was about a serial killer. Um, but yeah, feel free to come back tomorrow if this is not something that you feel like you can watch. So quickly before I get into this case, I just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This is all just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So Victoria Adjo Klimbier was an eight year old girl born on November 2nd, 1991. She was born in a bobo in the Ivory Coast in Africa to her father Francis and her mother Bert and she was the fifth of seven children. Victoria had a really loud, vibrant personality. She was always smiling. That is the one characteristic that you will always hear about Victoria Columbia. She always had a smile on her face. She was always singing, she was always dancing, she was so lively. She would always put on shows for her family. She was a really happy child, sang all the time, danced about a lot. She was a central figure within her family. She was very helpful. She was the entertainer um, of the family. In October of 1998, a month before Victoria's seventh birthday, her great aunt, 42-year-old Marie-Thérèse Quau, came to visit. Marie-Thérèse actually lived in France. However, she was over in the Ivory Coast because her brother had recently passed away and the funeral was happening over in the Ivory Coast. So while she was over there, she decided to go and visit some distant family members, including her nephew, which was Victoria's father. While she was there, Marie Therese proposed that if the family wanted, she was more than happy to take one of their seven children back over to France to get a better education. This kind of situation is relatively common in the poorer parts of Africa. If a family has a slightly more wealthy connection, like family member or something, then it's quite common for them to take some children over from a different family to go and get a better education elsewhere and just give those children better opportunities in life. Victoria's family was rather poor and to have seven children, not all of them are gonna get a chance at a good education and so the family were over the moon with Marie Therese's proposal. It had changed the child's life so much. Whichever child was chosen, would have so many better opportunities in life and the family was so grateful and Victoria was the child that was chosen to go overseas to France with her aunt. However, Victoria wasn't Marie Therese's first choice of children to take over. In fact, none of the Climbier family were. She initially planned on taking a little girl called Anna from a different family. She had a passport made and everything. This passport said that Anna was her daughter just so that it would be easier to get her overseas. And when she got there and asked Anna's parents if they wanted to do this, they said no. And so her second choice was the Klimbia family. But now the passport that Marie Therese had was for a little girl called Anna. And it would be such a hassle to get this passport changed and people would get a little bit suspicious that she was changing her own daughter's name on a passport for no reason. And so Victoria from now on was just known as Anna. Marie Therese also had to find a way to make Victoria look a little bit more like Anna. Victoria had very, very short hair and Anna had really quite long hair. And so Marie Therese went out and bought some hair extensions just to try and make Victoria look a little bit more like the passport photo. And unbelievably, it worked. Victoria traveled halfway across the world with a fake passport. So Victoria and Marie Therese left for Paris in November of 1998. They were living on benefits and they got a flat given to them by the government. They weren't very well off at all, but Victoria was getting a good education, so she was happy. Before they'd even been in Paris a month, Victoria's school noticed that she was absent a lot. And so they got in contact with Marie Therese to let her know that Victoria was barely coming to school and Marie Therese said that it was just because Victoria was misbehaving. She was, she was a naughty child. In February of 1999, after four months at the school, 
Victoria's teachers really doubted that Victoria was just misbehaving and that she was a naughty girl because she was completely fine when she was at school. She was well behaved and so they started to worry that maybe it was a problem at home. Maybe something wasn't quite right at home and so they alerted officials. A social worker became involved with Marie Therese and Victoria and Victoria was labelled as a child at risk from a possible abusive home. Her teachers noticed that Victoria seemed exhausted. She kept falling asleep in class at no warning. Like you know how you can tell when you're gonna fall asleep. Victoria would just pretty much pass out. And by March, some of the teachers noticed that Victoria's head was actually shaved and she was wearing a wig. Marie Therese explained this to teachers by saying that Victoria has a really bad skin condition on her scalp and so they shaved all of her hair so that it'd be easier to treat and now she just kind of wears a wig whenever she goes out. This was on March 25th, 1999, when Marie Therese had this conversation with teachers and explained the situation with the wig. And subsequently, after that day, Victoria never returned to school. Then, a month later, on April 24th, Marie Therese took Victoria and they fled France and moved to London in England. They'd actually been evicted from their flat for not paying their rent, and by the time that they left, Marie Therese owed the government, the French government, over £2,000 in falsely claimed benefits. Once they got to England, they stayed in a bed and breakfast, which is like a hotel type situation that provides you with breakfast in the morning. And after a couple of weeks, they finally settled in a hostel in northwest London. When they arrived in England, they went to meet a distant relative of Marie Therese's named Esther, who was a midwife, a counsellor, and a preacher. Then I saw this bubbly little girl smiling, you know, jumping about. Obviously, the girl knew she wasn't Anna, but she, she was responding to Anna because she had been briefed that way. But quickly, Esther began noticing some off things about Anna. She was very small, she was very frail, she was very weak looking. However, Esther didn't think too much into it because, I mean, a lot of seven-year-old girls are naturally very slender just because they're very active at that age and she just didn't think too much into it. But then she noticed that Anna was wearing a wig and so she took it off her. And there were little blisters on the head and he said the child had some... Um, uh, either hot water accident or something. The child was quite happy wearing the wig. But of course Esther had no reason to doubt Marie Therese and Victoria or Anna seemed happy as she was so there was no real red flag at this point. Marie Therese attended over 20 different kind of meetings with the government for things like financial aid, free or cheaper housing, just any kind of benefits that she could get to help her and Victoria live. Victoria actually accompanied Marie Therese on at least 10 of these visits and a lot of the workers there noticed how Victoria looked very like unkempt and one of them even likened her to a child from an action aid advert. But the staff didn't take any action, they just kind of assumed that Marie Therese had dressed Victoria up that way, like made her look unkempt on purpose in an attempt to persuade the authorities to hand out money. So they thought that Victoria looked really bad so they'd feel bad and then give them more money. By June, Marie Therese actually got her own job working full time at a hospital and she just left Victoria at home alone with nothing to do. She didn't enroll her in school and Victoria would just spend at least six hours a day at home alone. After a few weeks working at this job in the hospital, Marie Therese met a woman named Priscilla Cameron, who after a few chats agreed to look after Victoria or Anna during the day while Marie Therese was at work. Quite friendly, you like to smile a lot, quite a lot. She took a shine to my brother Patrick. When Patrick was there, Victoria was at her happiest. They would dance together, they would sing together, they would laugh together. Patrick just really brought out this really happy, lively side of Victoria that she kind of lost ever since she left home. But when it came time to leave Priscilla's house and go home with Marie Therese, there was a very noticeable difference in Victoria's mood. She would go from being this happy, lively, smiley little girl to suddenly very quiet and very kind of on edge. Straight away she'll be, you know, talking to her in French and from what I can see, it's, it's not a good conversation. You know, she looks 
agitated. I said to my mum, that doesn't seem right. Why would she come and, you know, shouting at the child? On several occasions, Priscilla noticed a lot of kind of cuts and marks on Victoria's hands. And so she asked Mary Therese about it. And Mary Therese said that Victoria liked to play with blades and she just ended up cutting her hands with the blades playing with them which is ridiculous. I have never heard of a seven-year-old playing with blades and if she was playing with blades that means she has no toys. That means she has been neglected at the very least. Then six weeks after their visit to Mary Teresa's distant relative Esther they bumped into her again on the street in town and this time, Esther noticed some really worrying things about Victoria. I noticed a scar on the right cheek, and I said, what's happened to the child, you know, this bruising or scar? And she told me that the child um, fell from escalator. They were going to the city and fell now, and the escalator called the bruising. And so at this point, Esther was really kind of concerned for Victoria or Anna, and she was very kind of suspicious of Mary Therese and so she planned to go and visit them at their living situation in the hostel in three days time. She felt that Victoria had lost even more weight and seemed even weaker than she did six weeks ago. She felt that her living situation and her lack of schooling was just unacceptable and all of this mixed with the physical injuries on Victoria really really concerned Esther to the point where she felt that she had to take action. The next day Esther anonymously rang up social services and told them all of her concerns about Victoria and Mary Therese and the woman on the other side of the phone said that she would submit a referral that same day. And I told them my concerns that the house wasn't very clean, was dirty, people were smoking and the room was small and untidy and Anna didn't look very well. I would want somebody to go there urgently to investigate. But still, three weeks later, nothing really seemed to have happened. And so Esther decided to call social services once again just to see if things were moving along because she was really concerned for Victoria. The person on the phone said that social services probably had done something about it, but they just, they didn't give any form of evidence. It just wasn't a very reassuring phone call for Esther at all. That second call didn't trigger another referral. It didn't even trigger an update on the original referral, which it should have done at the very least. Social services just really let down Victoria Klimbier in this case. Finally, three weeks after Esther's initial call, the details of this case were finally entered into the system, which to me is just unacceptable. When you're dealing with the possible abuse of a seven-year-old girl, it's unacceptable to wait three weeks for that. In June, while catching a bus, Mary Therese got talking to the bus driver, a man named Carl Manning, who was actually about half her age. One thing led to another and quickly, the two of them got into a relationship. And when I say quickly, I mean quickly. After just three weeks of knowing him, Mary Therese and Victoria moved into his one bedroom flat with him. Victoria and Mary Therese left the hostel and moved in with Carl Manning on the 6th of July, 1999. And then the following day on the 7th, Social Services sent a letter to the hostel informing them of a home visit to come and see Mary Therese and Victoria or Anna. On July 14th, two social workers turned up at the hostel to have this home visit, but of course it was too late. They'd already moved out and moved in with Carl Manning. The social workers were told by others at the hostel that they'd actually moved out and the social workers just left it there. They didn't ask where they'd gone, they didn't ask how they could contact them, they just gave up. That was enough for them. Prior to this visit, the two social workers named Laurie Hobbs and Monica Bridgman hadn't done any form of background research on Mary Therese and Victoria. They only had what they themselves described as the haziest idea of what they were actually investigating with the two of them. They also made absolutely no attempt to try and follow up on this case. They made no attempt to try and find a new address, no attempt to try and contact them, absolutely nothing. All they did was write in the notes of the case on the system, not at this address, have moved. And that was it for those two social workers. That was enough effort 
to put into this. Meanwhile, Victoria and Mary Therese were adjusting to life living with Carl Manning in his one bedroom flat and living conditions in the flat were arguably worse than living conditions at the hostel. The flat had three small rooms, a bedroom with a double bed for Mary Therese and Carl and it also had a sofa bed in it for Victoria. They had a very small kitchen and an even smaller bathroom leading off of it. Carl made it very, very clear right from the beginning that he did not like Victoria. He would constantly tell Mary Therese that he did not want her around and as you can imagine, Mary Therese didn't really need much convincing to try and get rid of her. After just a week of living in this flat, one night, Mary Therese went and bundled up a bunch of Victoria's things, put her in the car on July the 13th, and took her to Priscilla Cameron's house. She explained to Priscilla when they got there that they've just moved house, they've moved in with her new boyfriend, and he doesn't really want her around, so if Priscilla Cameron wanted to keep her, and raise her as her own daughter, she could. Obviously Priscilla said no. She said she'd keep Victoria overnight since it was getting late. However, the next morning, Mary Therese had to find something else for this child. But as soon as Victoria came into the house, the Camerons noticed a severe decline in Victoria's physical health. And I had a hat on and my mum said, um, I know you're in the house, you know, take your hat off. She took the hat off. And then we saw these injuries. Some of them were fresh, so she was recently beaten. There was a cut on her right eye so bad that there was a flap of skin hanging off of her eyelid. There was a rather large burn on her right cheek, just along with so many different cuts, bruises, scars on every single part of this child's body. There was um, a healing burn on her right cheek. It was horrific to see that. And out of all this, this girl was smiling. Yeah. The next morning, Priscilla's daughter Avril was so concerned about Victoria that she actually took her to the hospital for her injuries. Obviously, because they weren't there for any kind of specific reason, they were there for just Victoria's whole body of injuries. Normally when you go to the hospital, it's because of one specific injury, but they were there for Victoria's whole body. And so it took two whole hours for the doctors to examine Victoria Climbier from head to toe completely. They took Victoria's clothes off to do these examinations. And obviously the Camerons had never seen like underneath Victoria's clothes. And as you can imagine, there were so many more injuries on Victoria that her clothes would hide every day. Victoria had multiple cigarette burns all over her thighs. She had a huge mark across the whole length of her back and a very similar one across the back of her legs as if she'd been like hit with something. The doctor confirmed that there was a strong possibility that Victoria's injuries were not accidental. And the paediatrician that saw Victoria also noted that he was strongly suspicious that the injuries were non-accidental. The doctors alerted social services and they actually put her on a ward until she could be seen by social services just so that she was safe until then. Social workers even asked Victoria herself how she got such injuries all over her body and Victoria actually told them that they were self-inflicted which they obviously didn't believe. The next morning, Mary Therese was called to the hospital to see the social workers, and she claimed that Victoria's injuries were all due to her having scabies. Scabies, if you didn't know, is a skin condition. It causes severe itching, it causes rashes all over your body, and Mary Therese said that Victoria had scabies and all these injuries were just from her scratching at her rashes. Although many of the doctors that saw Victoria believed that these injuries were not self-inflicted and they were also not accidental, one doctor named Ruby Schwartz unbelievably diagnosed Victoria Climbier with scabies without even speaking to Victoria first. I knew what I saw and for the doctor to say rashes. Excuse me, what about the burn on her face, the cut over, over her eyes? I'm not a medical person, but I know the difference between a rash 
and a cut. Another doctor then wrote to social services saying that they'd actually made a mistake and there was no need to look into this case anymore. Meanwhile, a social worker had in fact already picked up Victoria's case. After reading about her injuries and everything, she was reasonably concerned with this social worker. But then after the diagnosis from Dr. Schwartz came in, she decided to just trust the professional. Obviously, a doctor wouldn't diagnose anything that's not actually there and so she just trusted her. Which is understandable, but also very unfortunate that so many people were just either letting Victoria down in this situation or just not checking, checking things. The morning after she was admitted to hospital, right after her scabies diagnosis, Victoria Climbier was discharged from hospital back into the care of Mary Therese and Carl Manning. Just a little side note, around this time in July of 1999, Mary Therese made friends with a couple named Julienne and Chantal. Over the coming months, Mary Therese would visit the couple's home with Victoria and the couple recall her shouting at Victoria all the time and never showing her any affection. I just thought that was quite interesting to put in there. Then nine days after Victoria's discharge from the hospital, Mary Therese actually took Victoria back to the hospital, this time for scalding all over her head. Mary Therese explained to doctors that Victoria, in an attempt to alleviate some of the itching from her scabies, had actually put her head, put her own head, under the boiling hot tap and scalded all her head and face. Let me just remind you, this is a seven-year-old girl. I know I'm saying this so much, but a seven-year-old girl would not put their head in a boiling hot tap and her head must have been there for a while for the amount of scalding to happen if you do that to yourself you put your hand in and you like go like that because it's too hot to keep there there is no way you would put your head in there and just stay there and let it burn there is actually pictures online of victoria's head and face after the scalding and I'm not showing them in this video because they are so, so upsetting. So if you do go and search those, do do so at your own risk. But the burns were all over the top of her head, coming down onto her face, onto her nose. It, it's just heartbreaking. Those photos are heartbreaking to look at. And the hardest part for me, looking at those photos from the hospital of Victoria with all her scalded face, was that she was still smiling. She was smiling in both the photos that I saw. She had a really big cheesy grin on her face. She was always smiling. And that's the hardest part of this whole case, was that she was just so happy, no matter what abuse she faced from home. This is one of the worst abuse cases I have ever personally heard. And the fact that Victoria was just constantly smiling, constantly positive all the way through it. There were some amazing stories coming from some of the nurses about Victoria and she describes providing Victoria with some dressing up clothes from a dressing up box that the hospital kept and she described this pretty little girl dressed up in pink Wellington boots and some sort of party outfit going twirling down the ward full of happiness and joy and uh, described by nurses then and subsequently as a little ray of sunshine. But when Marie Therese would arrive for visiting hours at the hospital, the staff would notice an immediate change in Victoria. I think it's recorded on the nursing notes that the relationship between Quao and Victoria is more master and servant than that of mother and daughter. It also says in the notes a really vivid description of one time when Marie Therese was shouting at Victoria. Victoria got out of bed and stood to attention like a soldier. She'd been disciplined as if she was in the army. This is not how a seven-year-old girl should be brought up. The doctors recalled the shouting being in French, so none of them really understood anything that was going on, but they knew it must have been bad because Victoria was actually so scared that she wet herself. Unbelievably, all of these signs of abuse were just being overlooked. No one was doing anything about it. One nurse even witnessed a mark on the side of Victoria's body on her side in the shape of a belt buckle. How how and why would that be self-inflicted? In, in what way could that be self-inflicted? While Victoria was there in the hospital, the doctors found no evidence of scabies. And so now, the cause for all the other injuries on her body didn't exist anymore. She never had scabies. She didn't have scabies. 
So you'd think that the doctors would be suspicious of why she had all these injuries on her body, but they weren't. And still, despite all these huge, huge red flags, Victoria Klimbia was discharged from hospital again into the care of Marie Therese and Carl Manning. However, because the hospital detected a possibility of abuse, Victoria's case was passed on to social workers in Haringey, specifically a social worker named Lisa Arthur Worry. Lisa had only been qualified to do this job for 18 months, and don't get me wrong when I say this, I'm not saying that she wasn't qualified to do this job, obviously she'd gotten her qualifications. However, cases of this severity are usually given to the people with the most experience and Lisa was very new to this job. She hadn't experienced anything of this level at all yet. Cases like this are usually given to people with possibly decades in the field and I don't know why this one wasn't. Multiple things went wrong here. First of all, Lisa being assigned the case at all. It wasn't her fault that she was assigned the case but she just didn't have the experience to deal with something of this severity. Secondly, because she was so unexperienced, her more experienced supervisors were supposed to be just constantly monitoring her while she was doing this case, but they weren't. And third of all, when Lisa would make home visits to Mary Therese, Carl Manning and Victoria, she would only ever speak to Mary Therese and Carl. She never once spoke to Victoria in person. The child that is supposedly at high risk of abuse, she never even spoke to her. Of course the parents are going to lie if they are abusing their child. They're not going to completely come out and admit that to a social worker. So why she didn't speak to Victoria, I don't know. Lisa said that the flat was tidy, Marie Therese and Carl were well presented, the child was well presented, she seemed happy. To her, nothing seemed amiss. From this point on, Marie Therese kept Victoria well away from hospitals. They'd learned their lesson, now they had social workers involved and obviously Marie Therese didn't like these social workers sniffing around their family and so she just stopped taking Victoria to hospital for her injuries. Instead, she would take Victoria to churches and claim that she was her mother, she was Anna's mother and that her child was possessed by the devil. Unbelievably, because she went to more than one church, she went to multiple churches, saw multiple different pastors, and every single one of them just trusted her. They saw all the injuries on Victoria, all of them, the burns on her face, everything, and they just prayed for her. They thought that the devil was living inside of her. But on another occasion, when they visited a different church and told a different pastor the same story, he didn't quite believe them. He saw these injuries on Victoria and he suspected it was abuse, but he didn't do anything about it. Victoria herself, a seven-year-old girl, told this second pastor that Satan had told her to burn herself. And even though this pastor did believe in demonic possession, he didn't believe that this was a case of it. As time went on, the abuse just got worse and worse and worse to the point where Victoria actually became incontinent, meaning that she no longer had control over when she urinated, when she defecated, and her body just began closing down. She ended up soiling her sofa bed so badly that Marie Therese just threw it out and never actually got Victoria another bed to sleep in so she just kind of had nowhere to sleep. And instead of buying Victoria a new bed, even a new sofa bed, a, a mattress, an air bed, anything, they would force her to sleep in the bathtub. They would force her to sleep in the bath inside of a bin bag as if it was a sleeping bag. And obviously because she was incontinent at this point, this bin bag, this same bin bag every night was just full of her own excrement. She was put to bed every night in an unheated, unlit bathroom, wrapped up inside a black plastic bin liner with no blankets or sheets. She was, in addition, tied so that she couldn't get out. Her hands were tied with masking tape and the bag was tied up around her. At this point, the abuse was horrific. Victoria would be starved for days at a time and when she was allowed food, it would be on a plate in front of her and her hands and feet would be tied so she, the only way that she could eat it was by pushing her face 
into the plate of food. In August, Mary Therese applied for free or cheaper housing for her and Victoria to live in, and it's assumed Carl Manning was also going to live with them, even though his name wasn't actually on the kind of application form. Because I believe the angle that they were going with was that Mary Therese was a single mother and she couldn't afford housing. And obviously, if they knew that she had a boyfriend, Carl Manning, she wouldn't be a single mother so much anymore, would she? And then in October, social worker Lisa Arthurworthy visited them at their home to tell them that their housing application had been unsuccessful. She got very upset and Victoria, this is an example of how well trained she was, chipped in and appeared almost, to, you know, with hindsight to have been taught to say this, said, why can't you find us a home? You do not respect my mummy. But Lisa explained to them that the only way that they would be able to give them housing was if the child was at risk in their current living situation. And because of this act that the three of them had been putting on for so long, Lisa didn't think that Victoria was at risk. Then three days later, on November the 1st, Lisa receives a phone call from a hysterical Mary Therese. She was screaming, crying down the phone, saying that Carl Manning, her boyfriend, had sexually assaulted her daughter, Anna, and that they needed to move away from him immediately. They needed this free housing. So Lisa told Mary Therese to come to her office with the child and they can talk about the situation and some possible housing. And so she did. But they also brought Carl Manning. But Mary Therese didn't think these claims through, obviously, and neither did Carl Manning. They never once thought that obviously he'd be arrested, probably imprisoned, put on the sex offenders register, that Victoria would have to get physically examined. Like, they just, they didn't think how serious such a claim was. The measure this gives you of the woman is an utterly heartless woman who would have subjected an innocent child to the traumatic pro procedures of a sexual abuse investigation just to get her hands on the key to a council flat. When Mary Therese was told the consequences of her allegations, she quickly withdrew all of her claims and the three of them just went on their way. The fact that these claims were put forward in the first place, whether they were withdrawn or not, the fact that that man was still living with a seven-year-old girl, I think there definitely should have been some level of investigation there. Because who knows, that could have been true and then Mary Therese might have just withdrawn them just because she didn't want her boyfriend to go to prison. I think there definitely should have still been some level of investigation, but there wasn't. No, Victoria was allowed back into the care of Mary Therese and Carl Manning once again. The man that was her sexual abuser 10 minutes ago. So now it was left to social workers to kind of make sense of this situation and decide whether they think that Anna really is in danger. Lisa Arthurworry wrote physical letters to the family, which were ignored. She texted Mary Therese, rang Mary Therese, left voicemails for her. Everything was ignored. She made a spontaneous visit to the flat, but there was no answer. At this point, she didn't know what to do, and so she got in contact with the police to see if they could help her trace the family. But she didn't actually get anywhere with that, and I don't know why. I don't know whether it was on the police's end that they decided not to go through with it, or on Lisa's end. I don't know what happened there. On February 18th, 2000, Lisa Arthurworry sent her last warning to the family, saying that if they didn't reply to this letter, then she would close Anna's case. A week later, on February 25th, Victoria Climbier's case was closed, but at this point, it was already too late. The day before, on February 24th, Mary Therese had taken Victoria once again to a church, claiming that she was possessed by the devil and she needed an exorcism or whatever. And the pastor took one look at her and said, that girl is dying, get her to a hospital. The pastor ordered Mary Therese and Victoria a taxi because Victoria was falling in and out of consciousness. The taxi got here and he was worried about Victoria's state and so he took her straight to the ambulance station and let them deal with it. The ambulance team said that Mary Therese kept repeating, my baby, my baby, although she didn't seem too concerned. They likened it more to as if Victoria had broken a leg not as if she was on the edge of death. They also said that Carl Manning seemed completely unfazed. They said he seemed almost as if he was not there. Victoria was taken to the emergency unit at one hospital. She was being treated there for a couple of hours and then they realised that they just didn't have the facilities to deal with 
such a severe case. This girl was dying and they had no idea what it was. And so she was transferred to another hospital this whole time she was falling in and out of consciousness and no one knew what was going on. Victoria was suffering from so many things that the doctors were just overwhelmed. They didn't know what to treat first. Most notably, she was suffering from hypothermia. Victoria's body temperature was actually so low that the hospital didn't even have a thermometer with a low enough capacity to be able to measure her temperature. She had so many visible injuries, too many to count at this point, and she was still falling in and out of consciousness and everyone was aware that she was dying. The hospital staff did absolutely everything they could to save her, but sadly, at 3.15pm on February 25th, 2000, Victoria Climbia passed away at just eight years and three months old. As an inquest was being done into Victoria's actual cause of death, because they knew she had hypothermia, but they also knew that she had so much more than that as well, an inquest was being done into her actual cause of death, Meanwhile, Marie Therese was arrested right at the scene on suspicion of murder. Victoria had over 128 separate injuries all over her body, including cigarette burns, tie marks on her wrists and ankles, and it appeared as though she'd been hit with several different weapons. She was terribly malnourished and she had multiple organ failure but her actual cause of death was hypothermia. Victoria's body was eventually taken back to her village in the Ivory Coast for her family to have a proper burial for her. Meanwhile, in Marie Therese's questioning, she was being very uncooperative, very snappy, obviously denying all her allegations. She, would, she just kept saying things like, I've just lost my child, I can't be interviewed right now. The following day, Carl Manning was also arrested on suspicion of murder, but he took a very different approach to his questioning. Carl Manning was very honest about his part in Victoria's death. He told police exactly what he did, exactly what weapons he used. He said that he'd hit her with bike chains, shoes, wires, belts, as well as his own hands. He also told police that Mary Therese used all the same weapons that he did, but she also occasionally used a hammer. Imagine what kind of damage a hammer could do to, to a regular seven-year-old girl, never mind a really malnourished and frail seven-year-old girl. He said in answer to one of our questions that that was the thing about Victoria, you could hit her time and time again and she could always take it, which is uh, sickening. Police went to forensically examine the flat that they lived in, but when they got there they found several empty bottles of bleach and the flat had been meticulously cleaned. Obviously, Carl Manning wasn't arrested until the following day, so he had all that time to clean up the flat, get rid of any possible evidence that might be lying around. But still, even after the thorough cleaning, forensics still showed up traces of blood on the walls, on every piece of furniture in that house, and also in the bath. And we managed to recover many, many samples of blood. Now, given that they'd already been cleaned, I think that gave an indication of, of exactly what had, what had happened there. She had been assaulted regularly and severely, and she'd bled. And even though they'd attempted to cover this up, it must have been in abundance. They also found bits of tape in the rubbish bin that were used to bind Victoria's wrists and ankles, showing the severity of the abuse. During the search of the flat, they also found Victoria's, or Anna's, passport, and that was when they realised that this was a completely different girl to the one that they had back at the hospital. After weeks of searching for Victoria's biological parents, police finally found them. And now they were faced with the task of having to tell them that their child had been abused to death. Victoria's parents then had to fly all the way from the Ivory Coast, all the way to England, just to identify their eight-year-old daughter's barely recognisable body. Marie-Therese Quau and Carl Manning's trials began on November 20th of 2000. Both of them were being charged for child cruelty and murder. Marie-Therese denied all the charges against her and pled not guilty, whereas Carl Manning half denied the charges. He pled not guilty to murder, but he pled guilty to manslaughter although he was still up for murder. 
So, during the trial, Carl Manning's diary was actually used as evidence where he'd actually referred to Victoria as Satan and said no matter how hard we hit her, she didn't cry or show signs that she was hurt. And Marie Therese was sticking to her story that she never abused Victoria, she was not guilty and all those injuries and illnesses that Victoria suffered were all because she was possessed by demons. The way she chuckled in such a menacing way and laughed dismissively. It made the hair stand on the back of my neck. In January of 2001, both Marie Therese and Carl were found guilty of child cruelty and murder and both of them were sentenced to life in prison. And just as a side note, many of the doctors and social workers that I've mentioned in this video have been let go from their jobs, rightly so. Their jobs are literally to keep people safe and they did such a bad job at the job that they are qualified to do and a girl died because of it. But at the same time I know it's very easy to blame all these professionals for not stepping in but Victoria wouldn't have died if it wasn't for Marie Therese and Carl Manning. But yeah, thank you so so much for watching this video, I know it was a very heavy one, I am sorry. But this was a very very requested case for me to cover, it always has been. Um, I get a lot of requests for cases like this and I just want to let you know that I will probably cover them one day but I want to space them out as far as I can because cases like this just do leave me in such a low mood for a long time. I just, I get so sad about things like this. So I will cover them at some point, just don't expect them to be like one after another about like child cruelty cases i just can't do it but yeah thank you so so much for watching if you enjoyed this video make sure you leave a big thumbs up on it and subscribe if you want to see some more true crime videos because it's true crime week this week and yeah thank you so so much for watching and i will see you in the next one bye